Hey guys, I hope this video finds you well and hanging in there through this pandemic. Uh, the good news is we're on the backside of the semester. If you're doing okay at this point, then it's all downhill from here. And you know, all you have to do is finish strong and you're going to be fine. The rest of the semester, rest of the text, pretty, pretty, pretty easy compared to the, the first half, I think. So, you know, we got to do chapter 10, talk about classes and object-oriented programming, and there's not a lot new here, right? If you're comfortable with functions, if you're comfortable with variables, then you're going to be just fine with chapter 10. If you struggled with functions, well, like I was saying in class before we, you know, went to this online format, you know, people didn't get functions, you're going to be in trouble. So if you're not comfortable with functions now, you're going to be in trouble. But if you are comfortable with functions, this is going to be pretty easy. Okay. So in this video right here, I'm just going to go through most of the theory of classes and it's going to be really brief, right? Chapter 10 is really brief. Chapter 11 is really brief. Chapter 12 is really brief. Like I was saying, going downhill, you're just going to get kind of a, a, a taste for what classes and object oriented programming are. Uh, in this chapter. So, you know, the video that I did the, that you're going to watch after this, you know, brief introduction to classes in Python, that really covers the section 10.2 and, and 10.3 content all in about 25 minutes. There's not a whole lot there in the text um, for this. And so 10.1, which is what I'm going to do now, is just, you know, the introduction to classes um, and a little bit of theory. And then 10.4, is some theory on how you can identify what classes you would need for your program. So anyway, let's go ahead and get started here and I'll get you in and out of here in like 15 minutes and you'll be, you'll be on your way. Okay. So, you know, the chapter talks about procedural and object oriented programming. And then there's a couple sections talking about classes and work with instances of classes. And then, you know, at the very end, 10.4 is, you know, how do you design classes? What are some techniques for that in finding the kind of classes that you need for a program? All right, so I'm going to throw some terms at you here. Procedural programming, that's what we've been doing so far. Okay, procedural programs are programs that revolve around functions. Okay, so you've had some experience writing functions now in programs that have at their heart, at their design functions are procedural programs. Okay, and those functions they are supposed to be doing one thing and one thing well and they form the building block of a program of a procedural program and they are you know what you throw in your main and you know you kind of like that assembly line uh idea where each function takes a bit of data does a little something with it and then passes on the next function to continue on from there okay so Procedures, functions, those terms are sometimes interchangeable depending on, you know, which language you're talking about, uh, depending on what the context is. But procedural programming, also known as functional programming, and procedures here on the slide, and then the text, they're referring to this, you know, from this is taken from the text, but here on the slide, procedures, we're, we mean functions, procedures, functions, synonym, they're synonyms, right? So you got some data. Um, that the functions are working with and that data is getting passed around. And this, the, the uh, focus on a procedural program or a functional program, remember procedural, function, interchangeable, you're creating functions, procedures that are working on data. Everything's built around the function, built around the procedure, functions, procedures. Again, those names are interchangeable. Now with object-oriented programming, it's different. Okay, so the fo the uh, focus here is on creating these things called objects, right? And you define an object using this thing called a class. Okay, now what's an object? An object is an entity that you create in your program that is combining data and functions and wrapping them up together, right? So on the slide says contains data and procedures. Again, remember functions, procedures, names being those names are interchangeable, right? So the data are known or is known as attributes or data attributes, and the procedures or functions are known as methods. 
So when you talk about functions, right, when it comes to an object, you, know, you can refer to a function as a procedure, function, method, behavior. These, these things go by a whole lot of different names. And that's one of the biggest challenges when you're first encountering object-oriented programming. It's just all the freaking terminology. If we were in class face-to-face, -face, I'd be using these terms all the time interchangeably just to get you, you know, used to them. But when you're creating an object, okay, you're combining data and functions, variables and functions. Those variables are known as attributes. Those functions can go by the names of procedures, methods, functions, behaviors, right? So next thing up is this term called encapsulation. And encapsulation is just the process of combining the data and those functions into a single entity, into a single object. So we're combining data, we're combining functions, that's encapsulation, that's the process of encapsulation. Okay, so rather than having functions and variables that are separate from each other, you now have these entities that are combining those two things together, right? And so, into an object. And so, an object then becomes something that represents something that you're trying to model in your program, okay? So, you might be making a role-playing game. You might be making an MMO. And within your MMO, you have player characters, you have non-player characters, you have armor, you have swords, you have monsters, okay? Each one of those things gets represented by an object, right? Each one of those things is represented by an object, okay? So this is kind of a, the figure 10 one here is kind of a representation of what we're talking about. Objects have these data attributes, these variables that belong to the object, and that data is manipulated by the methods that are encapsulated in that object. Okay, there's a lot of different benefits to this, but one main benefit is the fact that since we're writing the functions that operate on the data, outside code, code that is outside the object that's trying to manipulate the object, they manipulate the object by calling these functions, right? And so how we write those functions is gonna determine how that data gets manipulated. So we can have some input validation. We can control the data and how it's accessed through these functions that uh, are part of the object. All right, so data hiding, another term for you. That's when you have those data attributes, those variables, they're hidden from code outside the object. So this is what I was just saying a second ago. Code outside of the object, client code as it's sometimes referred to, that doesn't have direct access to those variables in the object. They have to access that data indirectly through the object's methods, through the object's functions, through the object's procedures, right? So those methods kind of act as a firewall. You can imagine, you know, let's, let's imagine that we have a McDonald's, okay? So McDonald's and you're a customer and you come in. Right now, you don't get to just go into the back and start making yourself some cheeseburgers, right? You don't get to go back there and start making yourself some fries, okay? All of that stuff behind the counter is hidden from you, right? Think of that as kind of like our data. If you want some fries, you want a cheeseburger, you got to talk to me. I'm working at the counter. You have to go through me, right? I keep you, I'm, I'm the firewall between you and the fry machine. So think of me as the method, as that function. You're the outside code. You're the customer. You want a hamburger, you ask me, can I have a hamburger? You don't get to go in there and, and, and manipulate the, you know, the hamburger machine, the fry machine, whatever. You gotta go through me. So the data, in this case, the fries, the hamburger machine, whatever, that's hidden from you. You don't get to directly access it, right? So this is a huge benefit because if you can't directly access my fry machine or my hamburger machine, you can't break my fry machine or my hamburger machine. You can't go in there and pee in the fry maker or, or throw garbage in the, 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 the hamburger maker making machine or whatever back there. You only get to request that I make your burgers for you. You don't get direct access. I can protect my machinery. I can protect my data because 
you ask me and I control how that process actually works, how that data is actually manipulated, how those hamburgers are actually manipulated. Okay, now that's one benefit. Okay, another benefit is object reusability. Just like we had functions that you could write and put into modules and then reuse those modules, you can do a similar thing with objects. Okay, so you might have an object that is responsible for keeping track of test scores for a class or something. Right? You define the code for that thing in a module, and then any program that needs something similar, you just import the module. Okay, so figure 10.2, let me revisit that McDonald's uh, example for a second, right? So code outside the object, say code that's inside the main method, right? Wants to interact with this object. Well, the only way that it, that it accesses or, or, or gets to access the data of those member variables at all is through the methods, is through the methods, okay? All right, so let's see here. What else do I want to say about this? Um, I mean, here's, here's another example, right? So, and then we're going to finish the video off. When you go into the next video, you're going to see, I'm going to talk about all this stuff. I'm going to give you coding examples. You're going to, I'm going to talk about making stuff private. I'm going to talk about making stuff public, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So um, anyway, so data attributes, right? Let's talk about a clock, right? So you have a clock. You want to represent a clock and a program with an object. So what are some of the data attributes? That object is going to have some data inside of it, some variables that are, that are encapsulated inside of it that are going to define what's known as the state of the object. So you'd have, the thing would have three variables, have second, have minute, have hour, right? Those are three variables that belong to that clock object. Now they're going to have some public methods and it's going to have some private methods. Okay, now the public methods make up what the client code can access or what it can use to get to the, 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 the data attributes, right? So for example, set time, set alarm time, um, get the current time, right? So if you want to know what the second minute and hours are, then you're going to have to invoke one of these methods. And one of those methods will return the requested data to you, right? Now you also have private methods, which are not generally accessed by client code. That is purely for uh, the object's internal use. So, for example, if I am the method working at the counter at McDonald's, okay, and you come up to me and you say, well, I want a cheeseburger, okay, then instead of making the cheeseburger myself, I could turn around and tell Tom, hey, Tom, I need a cheeseburger, okay? I'm a public method, Tom is a private method, and your client code, okay? All right, so... That's just the very beginning. Public methods, these are functions that client code can access. Private methods are um, methods that the object uses for its own internal processing. The data attributes themselves are variables that store data, and collectively known as the state of an object um, internally within the object itself, um, not directly accessible to client code, all right? So in the next video, I'm going to go through and show you some of that, you know, in action. But let me give you some more terms here. We're not quite finished yet. So uh, class, okay, what's a class, right? So a class serves as the code that forms the blueprint for an object. So this is the code that you write that says, all right, here's the clock object, or here is, you know, the McDonald's object, you know, the McDonald's store object. And so this specifies the variables and the functions, right? That's what you write to actually create this thing called an object. So you can think of it kind of as a blueprint, okay? Blueprint is the class and a house is an object. So you create one blueprint and you can create as many houses as you want. So an instance is an object created from a class. So if I got 10 houses on the street, okay, I had one blueprint to create all 10 of those houses. The blueprint is the class and each one of those houses is an instance of that class. 
That's an object that's created from that class in memory. Okay. So you can have as many instances of a class as you need, as many objects as you need. Just like you can create um, 27 different variables, X, Y, Z, A, B, C, D, whatever, right? You have separate instances of memory locations that can store pieces of data. It's just that now we create a class which says we're combining, by writing that class, we're combining variables and functions that can manipulate those variables that represent something. Right? And when we instantiate that class, we create an instance of that class, which is an object in memory. Okay. All right, so uh, let's see what else I'm gonna say here. I wanna give you some definitions. Um, a class definition that's a set of statements that define a class's method and data attributes. Okay, so at this point, I think I'm gonna wrap up because I go into this in much more detail in the next video, okay? I'm gonna, in the next video, I take you through and show you how to define a class, you know, what the syntax is for that, what the different parameters are for, and all of that. So let me just summarize what we talked about you know, what I tried to do here is highlight the difference between, you know, what procedural programming is, which is what we've done up to this point, and what object-oriented programming is. Object-oriented programming, creating objects. Okay, what's an object? It's this entity in memory that contains data and functions. Encapsulation is the process of combining data and functions into an object. Okay, and we talked a little bit about the motivation for this. So that way we can control how the data is accessed by client code, how it's manipulated. Data hiding is that process of keeping that data hidden from client code. You know, the ability to have objects be reusable. Okay, and I tried to give you an example of data attributes and public methods and private methods. What's a class? That's the code that you actually write that defines what an object is and what's an instance. An instance is a class instantiated. It's the actual object that's created from a class, okay? So, sure, that's really confusing at this point. Lots of terms thrown at you. That's the toughest part is the terminology. Make sure that you read the textbook really, really carefully to go through and understand what the definitions are. And then that will prepare you uh, for checking out the coding example video. Uh, that's next.